Today on Blue 58, everybody loves a good game of Would You Rather. In a weird way, that's exactly what the Packers are facing this offseason. Thanks to a listener question, we get to put ourselves in the Packers' shoes. Let's play Would You Rather with Aaron Rodgers. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of ThePowerSweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here for another episode. Got a big old bevy of listener questions I want to take up today. Before we do, I want to remind you that we are reading through Blood, Sweat, and Chalk by Tim Layden. We're going to discuss Chapter 2 in the next episode, giving everybody a little bit of time to ramp up and get involved if that's something that they want to do. You can also go deeper with our discussion on our Discord server, so head to patreon.com slash thepowersweep, become a member there, and enjoy the discussion among your fellow Packers fans there of this book and anything else that might be on your mind. Most of our questions for this episode are sourced from Discord. We enjoy the discussion there a lot with Packers fans from around the world. We do lead off, though, however, with a question from YouTube. Kevin has been thinking a little bit about the Aaron Rodgers situation and asks if there were only two ways this ends. Rodgers stays until retirement and either declines or he doesn't, or the Packers commit to Jordan Love right now. What do you feel more comfortable with? Not exactly which is better, but what makes you more comfortable for the team for, say, the next four years? I'll be honest, Rodgers is ripping the Band-Aid off from me, and the player that got me into the sport is giving me a headache if the rumor he was offered a contract that he declined is true. But don't blame me for being a little bit frustrated with the situation, but let's play out your counterfactual there. If you have to boil it down to the two options, Aaron Rodgers stays, say for, let's use his time figure there, four years, and he either you know finishes playing at a high level, or he declines and you're stuck with him anyway, would you rather do that, or... Commit to Jordan Love now, whatever the case may be. And I see some merits on both sides. First, Aaron Rodgers is probably better now than Jordan Love stands to be at any point in his NFL career. That's not a knock on Jordan Love. That's just a reality of how players develop. There's a good chance that a guy who's playing at an MVP level is probably the better player overall than any draft pick stands to be. Do you take the MVP now or the guy who could develop into the next MVP? You take the MVP now. That's what you do. But if you take the guy who can develop into, say, 85% of what Aaron Rodgers is, maybe 100% on the outside chance, and he's cheaper, and you have him for longer, those are some not inconsiderable assets there. Those are some major pros in the Jordan Love camp. However, if it's between Aaron Rodgers and for the next four years, or Jordan Love for the next four years, assuming that, uh, well, his development goes, and then you can decide from there, I think I still take Aaron Rodgers. I think if it's between Aaron Rodgers right now and Jordan Love and the potential, I think I take the known commodity there. Because at football's most important position, having a known commodity is about the best thing you can possibly have. And if the known commodity just happened to win the NFL MVP, I think you're in a pretty good spot. Janelle has an interesting question about player development. She asks, I often hear of players who have an obvious flaw in their technique and therefore get drafted later or even sometimes earlier despite this flaw. Common ones are offensive linemen bending at the waist and not the knees or quarterbacks having bad footwork. Every position has some, though. The question is, why wouldn't the coaches correct this? College coaches, that is. These athletes get to the NFL, and quite often within a year or two, the NFL coaches correct the flaw. Often it never clicks with the player, but on the occasions where it does click, how come the college coach never corrected it? A couple reasons for this. Uh, In college, it is a lot easier to get by with flaws in your game than it is in the NFL. Look at the many wide receivers who play at a very high level in college football, who just can't make it happen in the NFL. Why do they succeed in college? Because they are just overwhelming athletes. They can just blow by everybody on the field, and they don't have to be great technicians as a result. Wide receivers go in the draft like this every single year. You can throw out a dart, and you'll hit one. You'll hit five. 
These are the great testers. These are the guys that put up the insane highlight reel. You remember Malachi Dupree a couple years ago? He wasn't even a dominant college player, but he ended up being a seventh-round pick for the Packers because of that athletic potential. But he never really panned out in the NFL because he didn't harness that potential to its fullest. So I think we all recognize that that happens. The question then is why don't college coaches correct this? First, it kind of ties into the, the, the first part there with the players. Sometimes you don't need to correct it. Sometimes guys can get by and be successful without correcting those errors. A great example of this phenomenon is Tim Tebow. Everybody knows his laughably bad throwing motion has been the subject of ridicule since he came into the NFL as a wildly overdrafted first-round pick. Way back in, I don't even want to think about how long ago it was. But that throwing motion was the same in college, and he was pretty effective with it. That was partly because of his usage, partly because of the kind of offense that Florida ran while he was there. But he was affected with it in college, so the coaches really didn't have to correct it. But why don't they correct it if they know these guys are going to end up going to the pros anyway? Well, some coaches do. But the reality is that for these college coaches, it's not their job to get guys ready to play in the pros. That is a recruiting asset for some coaches. Think about like Nick Saban, partly just because of the level of competition you'll be playing against in his Alabama program, but partly because he is just that good of a coach. He can get you ready to play in the NFL. But for a college coach, it is his job to win in college. It is his job to get as much out of you in college as he can. And if he can get a lot out of you in college without spending time working on your technique, he's going to do that. That's what Urban Meyer did with Tim Tebow. He didn't have to correct his his throwing motion because he could be good enough as the bowling ball who occasionally threw to power Florida to two national championships, I think it was, and a Heisman Trophy for Tebow while he was there. He didn't have to be any better. The coaches didn't have to have him be any better to maintain their job security. Getting you coached up to play at the next level doesn't really help coaches succeed in their goals of succeeding at the college level. It's all well and good for them if you succeed in college, but how does it help them stay employed at their potentially very lucrative college job? Make sense? Kind of competing interests there. Ray Sepeg Bay has a good question about the randomness of turnovers. He asks, do you think interceptions are somewhat poorly attributed? Yes. The plain stat always felt misleading to me. Are there any sites that try to add nuance or detail to interceptions? Perfect passes ruined by wide receivers, failure that results in an interception, so on. I'm thinking about sacks and pressures or thinking about sacks and pressures had me considering this again. I won't just give you one, I'll give you two. First and foremost, uh, Football Outsiders has a tremendous analysis that they do every single season called Adjusted Interceptions. Basically, they start with the premise here that not all interceptions are created equal, but also uh, that there are just different factors that go into interceptions. So they quantify interceptions in a bunch of different categories. Hail Mary passes that uh, occurred at the end of the uh, the half or the end of a quarterback or a quarter, uh, interceptions that didn't occur that were actually just dropped by defenders. So that should count against a quarterback if you throw a bad pass that hits a linebacker right between the five and the zero, but he drops it. That's almost as bad as an interception. It's not your fault. It's no credit to you that that pass was an interception. Uh, passes that were tipped, that's often not the quarterback's fault. Uh, passes that were tipped and then dropped, and then so on and so forth. They go on and they see who ended up having the most real interceptions versus actual interceptions. Just as an example, last year, uh, Ben Roethlisberger had 10 actual interceptions, but 10 interceptions were dropped by opposing defenders. Same kind of goes for Carson Wentz. He had one interception that was at the end of a a half or the fourth quarter. Seven interceptions were dropped, taking his total from 15 to 22, 23. Uh, Matt Ryan, 
same kind of deal. Eight dropped interceptions. Aaron Rodgers actually always seems to pan out pretty well because he does a really good job of not putting the ball into harm's way at all. He had zero dropped interceptions last year. He just doesn't put the ball into harm's way. Oh, excuse me. He had zero uh, half-ending interceptions. He had six dropped interceptions, still considerably fewer than a guy like Ben Roethlisberger. So there are people who do analysis just on the quality of interceptions. So that's something you might want to check out. Just Google uh, football outsiders adjusted interceptions. Then if you look at sports information solutions, there are some interesting stats about uh, on-target passes, uh, basically how often quarterbacks are throwing catchable balls. You have to do a little bit of the legwork on your own to see how that correlates with interceptions, but it adds a little bit more nuance to the picture about uh, how accurate quarterbacks actually are. Uh, and this was one of the big jumps that you saw with Aaron Rodgers over the past couple of years. His his catchable balls went way up uh, from, I think, 18 to 19, and then again from 19 to 20 on target passes. Uh, but he also was hurt a lot by receiver drops because even though he was throwing a lot of catchable balls, uh, his uh, completion percentage in 2019 was not very good. Same with 2018. He was let down a lot by receivers. So there are two good resources to add a little bit more nuance to your discussion around interception. Kind of a rephrased question here, but uh, Terrell or Terrell asks via YouTube uh, whether Darnell Savage is a boom or bust player. So a couple episodes back, we talked about guys who might be boom or bust players for the Packers in 2020. Uh, We've gotten a a couple good questions as a follow-up as a result of that. But this is a good one uh, because Darnell Savage was not somebody I... uh, included as a boom or bust player for the Packers in 2021, but I think he definitely fits the criteria. So we were talking about guys who could take the Packers in big directions either way, who could really swing the fortunes of this team. If they play really well, it's going to help the Packers a lot. If they play really poorly, it's going to take them seriously in the other direction. And I think Darnell Savage does fit into that category pretty well. If he plays really well, that gives a lot the Packers a lot of options in their secondary in 2021. We know Joe Barry's defense is probably going to be pretty safety heavy. We know that he likes this star position a lot, a guy who does some interesting things in the in the slot and can really uh, be just a movable chess piece for the defensive coordinator there. And we know that Joe Barry is probably going to play a lot of three safety looks too. Darnell Savage, if he plays well, can help the Packers in every one of those. But if he doesn't play well... You're really kind of stuck with him for one thing, but beyond that, you're going to be giving more reps to Will Redmond, Henry Black, Vernon Scott. Then you're starting to get a little bit iffy. Even if those guys do play well, they don't have the athletic chops that Darnell Savage does. So I think uh, Terrell is right on here that uh, Darnell is a boom or bust player for the Packers in 2021. Old Packers fan uh, has a question related to wide receivers. He says... Uh, among those projected to make the 53, what do you think their forecasted roles will be? So I think we've got four definitive roles for Packers receivers. And a couple of guys really only can fit into one role, which adds some interesting twists uh, to the Packers wide receiver group. Uh, the first role is just the the volume shooter type role. So if you're like a 90s basketball fan, early 2000s basketball fan like I am, when the game was still super inefficient, the NBA game, that is. You had a lot of these volume scorers, guys that just took a lot of shots because they were the best guys at getting open shots on their team. Now we're all about efficiency and shooting three-pointers and stuff like that. It's fun, but in a different sort of way. Uh, Devontae Adams is the volume shooter among the Packers wide receivers. Even if some of his routes aren't super efficient, you just got to keep feeding him because he's the best. He can get open the most consistently, and most importantly, kind of unique, I think, among the Packers wide receivers, he can get open outside the structure of the scheme. Devontae Adams is the only person who can fill that role, Uh, though I think Marquez Valdez-Scantling and Alan Lazard can do different things to earn a lot of targets. They don't really get open consistently in the variety of ways that, that Devontae Adams does. So that's role number one. Role number two is the deep threat, and really that's only Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Though Alan Lazard has shown that he can get deep, he really doesn't get deep outside of the structure of the plays. Marquez Valdez-Scantling is the only person on the Packers roster right now, well, I guess on offense, 
who will line up with a defender across from him and just beat him with pure speed. He is the only receiver who can do that. There's no one else on the Packers roster who can just straight up run by guys the way that he can. And really, it, there are very few guys across the league who can do it the way that he can. So he is going to fill that role as well, which means that he is a really valuable guy to have on the field, even if he is inconsistent. The third wide receiver role that the Packers have is the Tyler Irvin slot motion type guy. And I think that role is going to be a little bit different in 2021 uh, because Omari Rodgers is a wholly different player than Tyler Irvin, though I think he will be in that role. He has very different skills. He's not quite as fast as Irvin was. Uh, He's built a little bit differently, so he probably is going to be used a little bit more like a running back than Irvin, who is a a running back kind of playing wide receiver. Uh, uh, Rodgers might be more of like a a receiver who moonlights as a running back. Um, But that is the role. That guy who motions across the formation a lot um, and just does some some things related to motion to get get the defense moving around. So those are three well-defined roles, and there's really only one guy in the Packers roster in each of them who can fill those roles. The star wide receiver, the deep threat, and um, the whatever you call the Tyler Irvin role, the jet motion guy. Beyond that, you've got the Alan Lazard quasi-tight end role. And there's a couple contenders there. There's Alan Lazard, obviously. There's Devin Funches. There's Equinemia St. Brown. You're not going to keep all three of those guys. So who is going to make the roster at that spot to do those sorts of things? I don't know. I think it's a pretty open question. Alan Lazard, obviously your clubhouse leader, but Devin Funches uh, is probably going to be asked and probably can do some of those things. He did a lot of the similar similar sorts of things in, in uh, Carolina and actually played tight end in college, though a different kind of tight end than a lot of the college t- or the, the tight ends we see in the NFL. Still, uh, have to kind of note that he did play some tight end in college. Um, but I think those are the four big roles for the Packers wide receivers. That's only getting us to four or five receivers. So how will other receivers step into those roles? I'm not sure. I'm not really sure what a lot of these other guys are as players. What is, just for an, an example, Reggie Bagleton as a player? We really didn't get to figure that out last year. Uh, nominally, he should be a slot receiver type guy, a bigger slot, but that's probably what he is. But he's not going to be running jet motion like a Tyler Irvin type. Uh, he's not going to be going deep like a Marquez Valdez-Scantling type. He's probably not the blocker that Alan Lazard is, so what does he do? It's not really clear. Chris Blair, same kind of deal. Malik Taylor, even though he played a few more snaps, what is he really? Um, he's got some good speed. He's a good athlete. Where does he fit? Uh, can he be that MVS light, I guess, player. Maybe he can get deep. Of the non, like, top four or five receivers, he's probably got the best deep speed. Uh, but it really remains to be seen. So I think it's a it's an interesting, interesting open question, a beautiful mystery, if you will, uh, as we head towards summer and training camp. Similar sort of question from Serb Packer. Uh, can we expect to have one main running back and two equals in positions, running back two and running back three? No, I think it's going to be more like uh, one and one A with Jones and Dylan, depending on the situation. And then I think you're going to have a third running back sprinkled in there kind of as an as needed sort of way. We've got to figure out how the Packers want to use their running backs in pass protection now, because they don't really have the stereotypical third down Great pass protector, good check down receiver sort of guy. Jamal Williams was that guy the last couple of years, and he did pretty well at it. A.J. Dillon is not that, not yet. Aaron Jones, I don't think you want to burn him up uh, just taking on blitzing linebackers head-to-head in pass coverage after signing him to a big, big contract. Uh, So who's it going to be? Uh, Kylan Hill could be that guy. Uh, Patrick Taylor could be that guy. It's not going to be Mike Weber anymore. He was released. But um, I think there is a role there. But in terms of the majority of snaps, I think it's going to go to a 1 and 1A in Jones and Dillon and then a sprinkling of a third guy. This is kind of an interesting question, though, just as a a philosophical one. How do the Packers approach this? Uh, For for years and years and years, well, for a couple years, I guess, we asked Mike McCarthy, please, 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 just turn Aaron Jones loose and run Aaron Jones. But finally, after being 
almost exclusively committed to one guy for years and years and years. He always just wanted to have the one lead running back. He decided to go backfield by committee when he finally had a guy who should just be getting all of the carries. Then Matt LaFleur comes along, and it looks like Aaron Jones is finally going to explode. He's finally going to get a, a chance to do a, a lot of you know, high-volume work as the lead dog in the, in the run game. And then after a year of being like 60-40 Jones to Williams, the Packers spend a second-round pick on another running back. Where is this all going to shake out? I don't know if we're going to get an answer until we see some games this fall, but that answer, I think, is going to be very interesting. Finally, Carl asks uh, about special teams. I've been thinking about players on special teams ever since Kumaro was uh, released and went to Buffalo. We said that he didn't contribute to special teams while Malik Taylor did. So here's the question. Why couldn't Kumaro contribute to special teams? Was it because he lacked the needed abilities or because he flat out refused, uh, like due to concerns about getting injured maybe? If the latter, how much does a player have a say in how he's utilized? I'm guessing you risk being cut if you're a fifth to sixth wide receiver and start making demands. You're right. As a fifth or sixth receiver, you do not have a lot of opportunities to make demands. I look back at the the snaps for Kumaro on special teams. It was actually more than I thought. In 2019, where he played the most snaps overall, he actually ended up with 140 snaps on special teams. The big issue is how those snaps break down. So just as a kind of for instance here, he only had two snaps covering punts for the Packers. Out of his 140-plus special team snaps, most of them came on kick return, kickoff coverage, and then punt return. Only two, according to Pro Football Focus, uh, came on punt coverage. Why is that important? Well, of those four units, which is the most valuable? I think it's pretty easily punt coverage. Why is that? Well, fewer and fewer kickoffs are actually getting returned. So that takes a lot of the value away from guys who cover kickoffs and who work primarily on the kickoff return team. If you're going to play special teams, you want to be playing on the valuable units. And that's something that a guy like Equinemius St. Brown, for instance, does pretty well. According to Pro Football Focus, he played 48 snaps on special teams in 2018, his really only full season in the NFL. But nearly a quarter, about 20%, a little over 20%, 10 of 48 snaps came covering punts. Same kind of deal with Malik Taylor. He played a lot uh, of special team snaps and ended up as a return man on, on kickoff duties a lot. So there's a little extra value for him there, but also covered a few punts for the Packers in 2021. So that's the first caveat there. The the value there is really on punt coverage, and and Jake Kummerow didn't do a whole lot of that. Not so much that he lacked abilities, but if you're going to put guys on those teams, you want your super-duper athletes out there. And at least compared to Malik Taylor and Equinemius St. Brown, Jake Kummerow is not a super-duper athlete. He's a marginal to pretty good athlete. Certainly better than all of us. Well, better than me. I should just speak for myself. I don't know about you. Maybe you're a workout warrior in your free time. If, you, if time, if you are, good for you. That's that's great. Why are you listening to this podcast? Go do some like CrossFit games or something. I don't know. Um, maybe you need something to do during your prodigious workouts. I certainly am not a, an elite athlete. Is I guess what I'm getting at. Uh, but Kumro is not the the speedster, the big burly speedster, uh, well muscled. I guess we should say speedster that you need. Uh, to cover punts. So maybe some of those those abilities are lacking a little bit. Um, but I, I just don't think he had the value in those those coverage sorts of situations. So the Packers didn't put him out there all that much. Now, we can't say for sure on this one, and he doesn't seem like this kind of guy. But a lot of times you just end up on special teams units because you're willing. Some guys are just willing to do whatever. Harkening back to my one season of college football, and I'm hesitant to to trot this out because, you know, this is a pretty limited experience, but it kind of sticks in my mind because I think it's a good example of just what being available is like. So there was a guy that came in, same year that I did, uh, I believe his name is Jordan, doesn't really matter, not important to the story, but uh, he was not what you would call a stereotypical football player. 
probably 5'10 on a good day, probably 175 pounds, 180 pounds. This is small college football. Not a real big dude. Not traditionally athletic, so not overly small. Uh, but he was two things. One, he was tough as nails. And two, he was willing to do whatever it took to get onto the football field. And so early in the season, any time we were practicing special teams, he would jump in for reps, whether it was on, you know, we need guys to, to fill in as gunners or blockers on, on special teams or guys to practice kick coverage or guys to be on the, the kick return team. He was out there. Number 28 was going to be out there no matter what. And he was willing to throw his body in front of anybody, whether as a blocker, as somebody just trying to take out a blocker, as a guy just trying to get down the field, whatever. He would do it. And eventually the coaches started to notice. And I think by the end of the season, he ended up on the traveling squad as a freshman just to play special teams. Willingness goes a long way. And I don't even want to connect this per se to the Kumaro situation, but there is some of that even at the NFL level. You get on the field if you're willing to do it. And if you've got the skills, so much the better. Uh, Kumaro is willing to play special teams. Uh, he just lacks some of those higher end athletic abilities that they want out of their coverage guys. And he doesn't contribute any return value like Malik Taylor does. Is that a good reason to leave your guy off as a fifth or sixth wide receiver? I don't know. I'm a little bit skeptical. What did Malik Taylor's kickoff returns really do for the Packers last year anyway? What did he really do covering kicks or punts or whatever? I don't know. Uh, maybe the Packers are better off just keeping Jake Kumaro around because he can catch five passes a year from Aaron Rodgers and it makes him happy. But that's a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff into what going goes into keeping certain guys around on special teams and, and off of special teams. Willingness, availability uh, goes into it a lot. And uh, if you can be a great athlete on top of that, you've got a really good shot at getting on the field and staying there. How that factors into whether or not you make the final roster is anybody's guess, but it's more than a non-zero factor. It's, it is significant in ways that we, I, I don't think, fully understand as people on the outside looking in. So I've got for you on this episode. Appreciate everybody who submitted questions for this one. Uh, if you would like to submit questions via our Discord server in the future or however you would like to reach the show, I would encourage you to do that. But if you want to do it via Discord, have some discussion behind the scenes as well, head to patreon.com slash thepowersuite, become a supporter there. But if you want to support us other ways, uh, the best way you can do that is just by sharing this podcast, uh, encouraging your friends to download and subscribe, help us grow the show that way, get more people involved in this conversation. Because as I always say, that's going to get more people helping everybody me included, becoming smarter Packers fans. And smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.